to it, RGH. She's muted. <laughs> Uh, we have a RGH, and I'm making the presumption that it's Rebecca Gagne Henderson. Sorry, I didn't realize it was muted. Yes, that's Rebecca Gagne Henderson. Yes. So I think this is the group that volunteered. Um, and the, the purpose of thank you, Melia, for convening all of us. And the, pur the purpose of this group is to develop an education or training plan for eligible providers and potentially possibly consumers as well, um, or beneficiaries of the MOLST. And the brilliant idea was to approach this like Dr. O'Sullivan does with any of her course curriculum. So is there someone who would like to take the lead and moderate or how would we like to manage that? I'd like you to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I am certainly not the expert. I know that I, I can certainly facilitate the discussions, but I know right. that I do have um, amazing, brilliant support with all of you who are trained educators. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> I talked too loud. So, Rebecca, maybe that's why uh, you volunteered me because I have a commanding voice. Um, so, I I would suggest then that we start with an I can be a scribe. I can pull up a blank word document, and we can start outlining our approach if that's helpful. Um, and I'm a good soldier, and I will take good direction from the SMEs here. Other thoughts about a plan? That, uh, Cynthia, that sounds, how do you, what do you, what do you think about taking the lead? I, I can take the lead except for today's meeting because I'm not mm -hmm. able to take any kind of notes. So Bob's I, gonna take them. I'm going to be your scribe oh. and Melia can be my backup. And I'm going to share my screen so everyone can see what we are writing. So I think we probably need to outline purpose and then our action steps. And then we can drill it down in greater detail on our next meeting. How does that sound? That sounds great. Sounds great. I would like to offer, offer Barbara Jacobs the opportunity to, to co-lead with me, though, because she's done a lot, lot of this, and I would value her expertise. Okay. <clears throat> Happy to do that. We'll be the we'll be the we'll we'll be co-leads then. I think if that Sorry. works for you. Okay. <clears throat> um. It, and again, I I will be the scribe. So. I, I want to, to the extent possible, to keep the, the meetings. I know that the group did indicate that January would be a realistic goal to share with the group. Um, so I think it'll be important to stay focused. And I will just write thoughts down as people provide them. So I think our purpose is to provide training. And I'm just rolling out thoughts. Someone tell me, stop this, write this. So there's no pride so, in authorship here. So please, someone just. So the, the word I, I to the word. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think there's a couple of um, different layers to this, but the, the probably the, the most pressing or the one that we need to think about and develop the most is the, is the training for providers who will be doing the most. And I just want to make sure that we've we've understood the sort of spectrum of um, contexts in which providers might be doing that. If there's people in clinical environments or people in uh, you know primary care physicians offices and so mm -hmm. forth, how to how to reach to those different groups is is part of what yeah. I think we need to think about. 
Um, the, the other thing is that at some point I would like to see some thought given to other constituents that have to become aware of most and, and what it what it means for them. And that would include people in, um, you know, EMS, people uh, in, in um, other professions that are other related health professions that, you know, social workers and people like that in nursing homes. Uh, so that's, you know, the, and then also, as, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the consumer, the primary, the patient population, some, some and or their family, some materials made available to them. But those, those are, the, I think the providers are the ones we have to think about first, because that's who's gonna get this done. I agree, and, Jim. Go ahead. I would also like to say that um, I had mentioned it before. I really think we need to have a um, have an eye on um, the the um, train the trainer because there's so, going to be educators that go into hospitals. There are yeah. going to be the the um, educators in in different areas that will need to be able to 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 train people. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. So all of these things, I think, make a lot of sense. And so I, I had a thought, too, and I like I wonder if you'll and th this idea of maybe a toolkit where um, uh, someone who's given sort of like uh, some training has kind of a almost a package that they can bring with them similar to the LNEC. Um, right back. I know you're familiar with that. That, mm -hmm. that sort of idea. So, and that and that can be done. But I like and Jim, I think you're right that our first priority probably needs to be the pro the providers. And I had some thoughts about that um, providing training from sort of a um, you know didactic perspective, but then having say three different case studies that we kind of bring into it. And and one would be as you say. The emergency department situation, which is not ideal, but it does happen, and so we could maybe have a case study for that situation. And then, um, what I'm more familiar with is what I have done is working with patients who fit the criteria, but have some time to figure their decisions out and how to approach those conversations, because it's really more about conversations than filling out the form. Mm -hmm. And then um, a third situation may be something that you all in the acute care setting might um, might want to see, you know, um, where I'm, I'm thinking about someone who maybe is in the hospital who things didn't go the way they were planned to go. And, you know, this might be a, an opportunity for a discussion, different than our discussion probably, but you know, bringing those sort of three scenarios in that maybe they could do all at once. Maybe they click on it, you know, to do a half minute, a half hour case study, you know, intermittently. But I do think that that problem based learning is a, a is more effective than just kind of teaching it from a set of PowerPoint slides. And if the if the faculty, the teacher, the instructor has kind of like the teacher, the teacher handbook piece of it, then they'll know how to guide the discussion. And for and for what it's worth, I um, will be doing a one to one and a half hour Zoom presentation for our faculty and our students and our preceptors for our family nurse practitioner students who are physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, and it'll have a CEU component. I'll have one. I think I'm going to do one and a half hours, but it'll be like a brown bag. And I haven't written it up yet, but it's going to I will. I plan on doing it sometime in like February um, that people can can click in and then then they'll get, the, you know, they'll get their CEUs. And I would probably just use the one case study, the case study about primary care for that one. That's my thinking and whether or not we use that is up to you all. It's just that's something I'm already planning on. That sounds good. Hi, Barbara so, Jacobs here. Um, what I'm thinking though, this is, and, and thank you for everybody's thoughts. They're great thoughts. Um, but I do think this is our preliminary planning meeting for how we're going to attack 
uh, sort of attack our educational agenda for most. So I think we really do need a some sort of uh, educational plan here. I mean, here, yes, talking about the pedagogical approaches, case studies, uh, individual sessions, CT train, that's one thing. But I'd like to go back to what Jim presented, is he talked about levels. And I think we should perhaps think about the, I think of it more as in tiers, T-I-E-R-S, of, sure. of who is our audience, then once we know that, and for what reason we have those audiences, then we can maybe at our next meeting talk about our pedagogical approaches. Um, but we clearly yeah. have a most training design right now, and how do we want to revamp it for the future? So I'm looking at kind of the near, here, far kind of way we do things at Harper Hospital. They keep telling me to think that yeah. way. Uh, but we have we have a training session now. We we know how it works and how do we want to adjust that, modify it, revisit it, recapture it, based on who our tiers of audience are and or is, and then we can go talk about pedagogy and case studies and all sorts yep. of things. No, I, I just offered it because it was plan. something in pro it's something already in process, Barbara. But I totally agree. Um, Absolutely. Certainly. Yep. But I, I would like I to see to... us get a plan. Um. Regarding EMS, I think, I, I know we said, well, we're not going to do that right now, but I think it is really important. I just did a community education where a woman told me that her husband had coded and they had called 911. By the time he got there, he was flatlined and she told the EMS, do not touch him. And they said they were mandated by law. In the community education um, that I did, there were two EMS people who said yes, no matter what anyone says, they had to code him. I think EMS needs a lot of education, and, and I think it would behoove us to get the EMS people involved on that piece. They are, I think. Yeah, That's incorrect, though, Rich, right? Rich, like, Rich Kamen. Yes, it's incorrect. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, Rich Kamen is, uh, the is, wife, is involved. The wife said no, and they did it anyway. Right, next of kin. Mm -hmm. So we, we have two EMS representatives on the group. We have Dr. Kamen, and then we have John Spencer, who is the chief of the Suffield um, Ambulance Company. So Dr. Sussman, you have had your hand up. Yes, yeah, so great discussion. And as we think about rolling out MOLS training more broadly this time, I think it might be valuable to think about the current training we have, what some of the barriers have been to training a lot of people. And I know one of the things we spoke about previously is we aren't even clear how many people have actually been trained. I think Barbara Jacobs probably knows how many she has trained, but I think many of the others just don't know. I bring that up because if we think about some of the work that we've done and we want to have this as broadly available as possible, we might want to think about tools that will allow us to get it out there. So whether it is a video based or case based, whatever we want to use, I think having something that can be spread easily without a lot of trainers, because I know everyone's incredibly busy. So just to think about something that meets our policies and procedures is not too long. Otherwise, people will not do it and something that is easily accessible. So those are some of the principles I think we should think about as we are putting together this training opportunity. So can I circle back to um, Barbara Jacobs' comments and does it make sense then to focus on two areas for the next um, 45 minutes, whatever the time is, and identify the audience and so that we can put our are my fingers to the keys and then also Dr. Sussman then identify the barriers and then we can once I think we look at that then we can move forward with the other approaches and I see a second hand uh, Nick go ahead please thank you uh just clarifying sorry my dog just decided to chew her bone hey hey stop <laughs> stop that sorry um she's every time I'd start talking um the I just like clarifying question. Um, are we we're talking about a, like adjusting the like like the training that this group like put together, right? Like the the current model for our training, right? Because I know a lot of like health systems do their own version of training on this. 
are we talking about like changing the entire scope of things or just like kind of our training? And then would somebody mind just really quickly filling me in on what exactly our training process looks like right now since I'm new? Nick, um, I think you're right. And I'm going to go back to what Scott was saying about looking at the barriers. I think we need to do an autopsy sort of on um, how the training looks right now. Okay. And right now, you can go to CT Train on the DPH website, take the course. It will spit out a certificate after you complete the test. And that's pretty much it. Got it. Or what Cynthia and I have done is take those same slides, that same test, and just do it in person. It's pretty much what, what I've been doing. Um, and obviously, we need that process for how other people are doing it other than what's on CT train. But that's how it happens now. And we need to look at that and see whether we're targeting the right audiences, what those audiences, who they ought to be. And I'm not too sure how it's done in EMS, and that's why we need EMS representatives. Did Barbara lose? Did she freeze, or is it May? It must be May. Oh, no, she's there. I'm here. Um, the other thing is, is it's been pretty much focused on acute care hospitals, and we need to realize that that's not where this audience right. is for most. Uh, we need to ex maybe even get somebody else on our committee who comes from the uh, home health environment or comes from the um, environments where our older population is living. And that's me. I'm, I'm home hospice, home health. Yeah, and but I'm thinking too more like nursing homes. Um, centers mm. oh, of um, we, we oh, have even, even primary care itself. Yeah. Yep. And well, primary we, care. So we do have we need two to representatives. Do we have representatives for home health because Tracy is home health mm -hmm. and hospice. Yes. And then Mag what Borelli, about the nursing who, homes, Barbara? The nursing uh, Mag, homes. Mag Borelli is our our Connecticut Nursing Home Association representative. Um, but we Ooh. can we can include, Mag is sporadic. Her attendance has been spotty related to other commitments, not because of disinterest. Okay. Um, but we can let her know that it'll be essential and so as the, we move forward. The, Nick, did the, that help? <laughs> yes, just one more follow-up question, if that's okay. The, the training as it is now is designed for providers, but I feel like you, you, you've given the training to other like allied health professionals and nurses and people who have just been interested in it, correct? But a that separate training does it's, not exist at this time. Yeah, it's, it's, if I could clarify that. So the training was an initial sort of a generic, it's for all, all people who care for patients, you know, and it okay. included social workers and nurses because sometimes they're sort of like the, <laughs> the squeaky wheel. You know, they can, they will have a, you know, they'll have a knowledge about something and, you know, suggest a, you know, a, an intervention or whatever it is. And, and then plus they, you don't want a physician to, or a nurse practitioner or a PA to write a most and have the nurse or the social mm -hmm. worker not know how to deal with it. So we felt very strongly that all healthcare providers um, who, you know, pretty much we, I think we sent it to doctors, physicians, PAs, and social workers, if I'm not mistaken, there was a, there was an email blast and all were um, expected really to take the training. Um, but that was, you know, that was almost 10 years ago or eight years ago. And um, the way it was written is if you were a provider, you could, you could probably have a decent understanding about what your, what your course of action would be for, you know, having a most be filled out appropriately and have some basic understanding of the conversation. Although that conversation is really an art and it's not just like, you know, you're not going to learn it the best ways to, to have those conversations in a, you know, 30 minute video. Um, so that was why, you know, I was thinking for a second step or even part of the for initial orientation, it might include students, um, learners walking through how that how that would would happen, and I would always do that with my own students who were nurse practitioner students. So, so I guess my 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 question, and then to get back to to Scott or Dr. Sussman's point about the audience is like, do, should we be thinking about creating a a specific training for different groups of people, like one for providers, one for nurses, allied health professionals, things like that. Nick, that's a perfect segue. 
Great. You, you teed this up so that we can you're, you're <laughs> we can go back to identifying the audience. And then in the notes, I, uh, Barbara, you mentioned tiers of training. That aligns, Nick, with your comment. And I, I guess the comment that I wrote, will, will we have a different training module curriculum for each audience? So should we identify the audiences first? And then we can have that discussion, uh, Nick, to, to answer your question. Do we have different training for each audience? I think, especially if we do EMS, that would be completely different than than providers or social workers. I so think the whole you, question of uh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. I, I was just going to say that sometimes having s sort of a foundational, you know. Um, <clears throat> introductory type of a training is helpful if everyone sort of starts from the same sheet of music and then you branch off from there. Um, you can write in sort of the basic uh, overview to yeah. what, you know, yeah. put that into packages that go to different constituencies. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, so uh, that part I think is, you're right. You're starting with basic definitions and, you know, whatever. Um, the, the concept is presenting that, but it apply, but the, you know, the EMT who's responding to the 911 call has to know certain specific things about it when he's, when he or she sees a most form on the refrigerator door or, you know, wherever it is, we're, hopefully we're not exclusively putting them on refrigerator doors anymore. And hopefully uh, they'll be in a repository. Exactly. Hopefully it'll even be an electronic avail uh, elect available electronically. But um, at the same time, the 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 person who's actually executing this, who's who's putting it together based on the discussion with the patient, um, has to have you know certain pretty specific things that they they need to know. Uh, they have, for instance. That they that they've discussed whether or not there is a healthcare representative somewhere in the background, or there's some other living will document out there, and that they're not confusing uh, that that in fact there there is uh, uh, a, a terminal condition or um, uh, end end stage frailty or whatever the language in the statute is, that that those basic things are present prior to initiating the discussion, and then. That's that's kind of you know, I I I think that it's to the the question is how do you reach the people who will be doing that the providers who will be doing that, and I think in the, if you're connected with one of the major um, healthcare networks in Connecticut, there are they have these training um, uh, systems in place that you know you could integrate this with and it actually is already being done but what about the people who are not that connected or who are you know in the the the, the geriatrician whose patients are living in the um uh, you know a, a supported living or assisted living facility or something something of that nature or or uh, aprn whose patients are living there those those people maybe in a more you know they're not as wired into those networks so how do they, how do we reach to those folks what's the best way to do that given that everybody's so busy and they're um you know they're all behind schedule anyway so that's i think those are the questions we've got to think about and that sort of speaks to um how much authority are we going to have you know like are we I know at one point people were saying it needs to be mandated and another point people were saying, well, it needs to be voluntary. You know, it's somewhere in the middle. I probably, um, you know, what would be our, what would be our expectation for, you know? Well, I think, I think it's, man, it's, it remains mandatory for people who are the actual provider who's putting yeah. his or her name on it. But um, that's, you know, the, but then you say, well, okay, it's necessary. It's a requirement. Huh. Well, where is it? How do you get it? And um, yeah. and making it as easy as possible. Uh, to Dr. Sussman's point about you know what are the barriers? Uh, mm -hmm. What are the real mm -hmm. barriers in people's lives and their work lives? 
in the work situations that make it difficult. So. Next. How long? I'm sorry, Dr. Sussman had his hand up. I apologize. Next I first. Go ahead, Nick. Nick is one, <laughs> yeah. and then Dr. Sussman is two. It numbers it on my end, Rebecca. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I think when you know, get, getting it out there and all that stuff is definitely going to be one of the barriers. I, I think getting back to like the audience question, like I, I see this as like there's like two ways we can think about it. We can think about grouping people, you know, like providers, right? Like, are you a nurse? Are you a social worker? Are you an EMS? Are you a provider? Right. Or, you know, we can think about grouping people by setting, right? Like, is this a, are you a person that works in a hospital? Are you a person that works in a a nursing facility? Are you a person that works in the field and like pre-hospital environments or something like that? And I don't know which, I don't know which way is better. I can see the benefit of both. I think the other thing we have to be careful about when we're talking about making different uh, training modules is we can't make like 10 of these things either, right? So we, I think thinking about ways to group things in, in other ways, right? Like does the training for is that is the awareness training for a social worker really going to be that difference than a nurse right, right? No. for those no. both people if they work in a hospital setting but i would argue that the training for ems right is probably different for the training for a nurse that works in a nursing facility so just something else to think about so nick here's where i'm going to take advantage of the group as as now the self-appointed facilitator. I poked, I, I've started the FAQs and I poked at other FAQs across the country. And to your point, what I identified in some states is that they've developed fact sheets, which are in, in a sense, a training sheet for um, groups of um, practice settings. So there was an EMS fact sheet, there was a patient fact sheet. So that concept, or model does exist in other states. So Dr. Sussman, I didn't want to lose yeah, my thought. That That's perfect. Th thank you, Barbara, because that's what I was thinking as well. We kind of have those people that are going to be don't having the conversation me. and completing a most form don't on the me. clinical side. And then I see the other group is the consumers. And I think we could list all or group all of those other individuals into consumers, the home health, hospice, nursing home, EMS, patients, families, they're all consumers of most and we need to know how to use it. I really like the FAQ sheets because those are easy. We don't need to have people go through a lot of training. They can just read it and get the the need to know. And then the discussion about do we make the training broad and and mandatory? Two comments to think about. One would be as part of the Connecticut licensure process. It, do we have an opportunity when we renew our license each year to make sure that people complete most training if we really feel that is important and we want to have it across the state? And the other is if there's CME for it, could this be part of the CME that we need to get every five years? There's certain courses that we need to complete. So just thinking about how we can build it into something that as uh, licensed professionals in the state, we need to do anyway. Could be incorporated into that. Yeah. Sorry, just to jump in on your point quickly for the the training. Are you you're referencing like the opioid training we have to do, like things like that? Correct. That or yeah. yeah. So as physicians, we need to do six specific CMEs every five years for the state yeah. of Connecticut. That type of thing. Ours is similar. I think we have to do. I think we have to do five every like five years or something like that too. But I just wanted to comment that the. Uh, the benefit of that is that a lot of schools have worked that then into their curriculum. Obviously, it's a little different, but then, you know, like I was able to skip that because I learned it in school. So that's another potential outcome of that, too. Um, so, Nick, that what you're what has happened is is sounding to me like a waiver. So if you received the training in your academic setting, then you for reciprocity, for example, you have reciprocity for the training. Yeah, that pretty much. So it might be that might be a good encouragement for schools to include training on this. That that would require some 
legislative changes as well. But not, not insurmountable though. Um, Rebecca, and then Barbara Jacobs. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, we were talking about barriers and um, I, I know that the training is an hour and a half or two hours, is that correct? No, it's an hour. I think it's about 30 minutes. <laughs> The, I think 30 because, minutes. The CT train. Is that all? Oh, because somebody told me that they had told someone, whatever the time was, they had told a physician and he just threw up his hands like he wasn't going to do it. But half an yeah, hour is certainly reasonable. Also, I just wanted to say that um, I think that the conversation project part of it needs to be really to the minimum. Um, and we need to keep this as concise and short as possible. Uh, I know you said that it's not just filling out a form. However, in reality, there are going to be people who take this very much to heart and have really in-depth, sensitive conversations. And there are those that are going to fill out a form if they do anything at all. And, and that these providers have passed organic chemistry. So I think that they can figure out pretty easily. I we just need to give them the nuts and bolts is what I'm saying. It needs to be very concise. Barbara Jacobs. Um, I just want to say I think this has been a wonderful conversation and people really have expressed a lot of exciting and new and different ideas about education, but I'm feeling scattered. Um, and, and I would like to recommend that really we meet in person. Um, for our next meeting and that we have topics of discussion um, instead of going from one kind of topic of how right. we're going to do it to who we're going to do it for to how we're going to expand it. I'm just feeling a little scattered, but appreciate all the comments and the conversation because I think it's a great starting point. But I do really think we need to to meet together, talk about this and and, and stay focused on particular areas of thought, like we did at our last meeting when we all got together, I forget what it was for, but we all met around a table and we had, you know, whiteboards and we stayed on topic. I think we really need to better focus for our next meeting. It's so, just my suggestion. Barbara, would it, it help Would it help if you and I um, kind of brainstormed for a little bit before um, we meet I again? Absolutely. I think we need to get the foundational subjects that we need to discuss and then talk about the various topics within yeah. that foundation. I, Audiences, yes, I think that would be helpful. You know, pedagogical approaches. I mean, all sorts of different things, but I do think we need to be a little more organized in how we come up with any resolutions or solutions. Well, this is a this is the first meeting. That's what this is all about. It's making sense. That's what I'm saying, Rebecca. That's what I'm saying. I think throwing out all these ideas in the beginning is great. And then that will help Cindy and I kind of pull it together and into columns of thought so that we stay focused on individual subjects. So Barbara and Cindy, I will send these notes along to you. And then that will, I, I think, help provide you a little bit of framework what the overarching topics or categories of discussion should include. Because um, I think how you're interpreting what we're all saying is excellent. I love what you put together on the on the paper. Thank you. Number two, an in-person meeting. So I, I, I love in-person meetings. Um, I think they are much more productive, but I also acknowledge and recognize that um, many have competing schedules. And, and, I, and again, I am going, my foundation is I love face-to-face, -face, most productive, but I also know post COVID that there, there has been successful work. So could I offer a hybrid that if individuals could not come face to face, then uh, we would we could offer that that approach. Yes. Sybil and, sure. and Barbara, we did do a hybrid actually, as I think this through, because Rich Kamen joined us virtually yep. when we were at CHA. So we did do that. Yeah, great. So before it's only we a suggestion get, on my part, it's only my I, suggestion. I love it. I love it. Um, what what I like it too. About that before I don't want to. I want to go to the top of the hour and stop. But let's look at or hear other thoughts about face uh, continuing virtually, 
hybrid or straight face to face. And then let's land on that so that at least we know the next meeting plan before we get caught up in another topic and we don't revisit that. Okay. How many votes for hybrid? Now it's the hands up hand. for those, are those hands up to speak or are they? That's a vote. That's a vote, vote. for hybrid. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay, um, Malia, is it helpful if we try to establish the next meeting time and where the site will be? I mean, we could certainly look at DPH um, and we could set up, um, you know, we have a, a few smart rooms that are our older generation smart rooms, so they're not the best, um, but I can look to see what we have here or if there are other thoughts. DHA was nice. Um, I don't know done. if I can, uh, Carl is not working on this. So I don't know if I, I can certainly do some outreach to CHA and see if they could provide us a room. Maybe it depends on where everybody's located. Well, CHA is in Wallingford is kind of the, the center of the state. Yeah. So that's very yeah. helpful. But Dr. Other Sussman, thoughts? you're, at, you're at located at, at, at Yale, is that correct? Yeah, CHA is no problem though. Okay. Oh, good. Well, well, I have to see if, if it's if possible. It's, yes, here, if yes. it's available, and I if, don't want to. If it's not. I mean, I think if we have a an outline, just like Barbara and Cindy mentioned, so we know what we're talking about, even if we had to meet completely virtually again, I think it would be successful. I think today's goal was to brainstorm, but I agree completely. We'll need a structured approach to make sure that we can get this in place by January, the plan that we can present to the other group. So I think if we can find a location, that would be great. but. I think if it ended up being virtual, I, I still think we could be very successful as long as we go into it with the right approach. So I will take that and I'm I'm hopeful that CHA will give us a room with some technology. Um, and the interesting thing about CHA, their, their offices is from home health is uh, housed there as well as leading age, the nursing home industry. So they may want to um, mm. participate when it's on their campus. So there, there's where there might be an advantage and we can get a uh, community-based and skilled nursing perspective. That's so a good now, idea. now I will go nice. back to hands up in terms of discussion. Barbara, you're number one and Cindy, you're number two or are those legacy hands? Mine's legacy. Uh, Mine's, mine was voting for the hybrid. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Is this, are we thinking December for this meeting? I, I would first look at, so I, I would hope December, um, earlier in the month rather than later. Um, because once we get towards mid and end of December, people start to take leave. Um, so I will see if there's availability. I will work with Malia. We can do a go-to meeting. I, I can't remember what the terminology is now, the new term of art for it, but we can send something out and then pick uh, the most popular day. It, again, all, all predicated on CHA availability. All right, so we resolve that. I feel like the, I'm gonna check that box off. That's great. <laughs> we have a plan for that. Um, and so Barbara, that's what I was trying to keep going back to starting with the first question was identifying our audience and then deciding what we're going to do from there. But does it make more sense to, are there other thoughts that we need to put to paper, um, or to the screen, or are we ready to send this to Cindy and Barbara? so that they can structure it a little bit better and I organize think that, it. 
I, I would say structuring the barriers is also very important. It's like dissecting the, the strengths and the weaknesses. So I think that's important. So are there we spend other a couple barriers? minutes on that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So I started identify barriers to training. I and again, I'm just writing down thoughts as they come up. So this does not um, look fancy, but how are how are individuals currently trained? expansion of training, how to reach the audience. Um, and some of these comments, when they're parenthetical, those are notes to myself. If so I could barriers. add that, um, if, if I could add that when we did this before, we developed a, a, really a, a number of great resources that I'm sure are very underutilized. So it may be helpful to have those. We could put the websites on what when we send the notes out, we can we can put those websites up again. They're all on the state, um, the state website, public health website um, for they were for families, patients, providers, you know, you name it. We had we had a lot of resources and they're probably not organized in a way that's helpful. So that might be another thing. But much of the work has at least been started and probably could be at least a background for moving forward. Thank you, Cindy. So, Barbara, can I ask you, when you made the decision to take this, Hercu make this Herculean effort into your work stream, taking it from CT train to the learning management system and your face-to-face -face training, why did you do that? What were the barriers that you identified that eligible providers were not going to CT train? Was it because it it wasn't in a centralized setting where someone was kind of helping them move along, or I think that'll be critical. What made you do that? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. One is people are used to using a in-house training system, and we have what's called HealthStream, <clears throat> and Yale has a similar system. So our providers in acute care hospital settings are used to going to that system for their training, number one. Number two, people didn't even know about most. So they didn't know mm -hmm. CT training was an option. And that was the main reason. Um, and and That's in right. order to get yeah. in, in order to get them to even know what most is, we put it on the training platform. And that was the way they got to learn. And thirdly, it's amazing how few people know. Yeah. 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 And I think thirdly, having a person uh, do the training in person then there's the opportunity to answer questions and to get into dialogue with people and to understand where they're coming from, what they think the barriers to using it might be. So it's just the the, the personal approach of my standing in front of a class of, you know, 50 okay. physicians from the cancer center, you know, it just helps to answer their questions in lifetime. So okay. Danny White was very helpful in getting it loaded, CT train loaded onto our health stream system. So that is an option. Before I forget, and it's really not, if we could put this on for a regular meeting, is um, once we get all the regs, everything, or rather the protocols fixed and whatever we're going to do, uh, what about a PSA campaign? And so topic. I put that up there into marketing materials, PSA, how to reach the audience. Um, and then I parenthetically did DPH because um, maybe DPH can help with that. Or maybe right. DPH can partner with some large systems, um, and not to exclude the smaller hospitals, but large systems, um, and do a PSA. I will tell you, and I was, I'm was i going to report this at our next meeting, Grizel sent me an email, and she tracks all the forms that leave the agency. And the forms have doubled this year from last year. So something is happening, which to me, that was good news. Yes. Do we know what the number of forms is? I don't know I, if you know it right I, now, but it'd I, be helpful. I, Did it go I, from 10 to 20 or 5,000 to 10,000? Um, I think it, uh, I will get that number. Grizel actually gave it to me, but rather than misspeak because I'm working on a different report and I have a million numbers in my head, I don't want to give you the wrong number. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. So I will have um, those for Tuesday. Perfect. Thank you. One other thing to bring up. So we also have the CT train as part of our health stream. 
I can ask, I can see if I can get statistics on how many people have taken it, because to Barbara Jacobs' point, I think having it in the native system can be helpful. But I also want to call out something that Rebecca said, that someone um, was going to do the training, but when they found out how long it was, they said, I'm not doing that. Even if it is only 20 or 30 minutes and that people that's people's response, I think we need to be uh, sensitive to that and figure out what we can do to have it be as concise as possible while still making sure that the people taking the course get value out of it. And I think having options so there can be a concise version and then for people that want to do an in-person class that's also available because I know some people <laughs> prefer that. But if people are not going to take the training, that's going to be a big barrier to our expansion of this work. I agree. The training is too long now. As the person who, one of the people who was involved with it, it's way too long. I would, even, I would support even that. Even if 30 minutes, Cindy, it's too long? We got into a lot of history. I don't think we need some of that background information. It's nice to know. It's not neat. Oh, okay. Um, there's there's stuff in there that we could certainly, I think we could probably cut it by half. Okay. One thing we have committed to as a group is that we're keeping Kathy's piece in there. Uh, Absolutely. Agree. Yes. <laughs> yep. I think an interesting, and I don't exactly know how to accomplish this, but marketing wise, I think an interesting angle to take would be like, how do we frame being most trained as something people want to put on their resumes? Right, like how is how is that an, an how can we make that an angle where it's like you know on your your certifications part of your resume you're put like you know I'm trained in like like I'm trained in like management of aggressive behavior from when I was a psychiatric technician I'm also trained in most I'm ACLS certified right I think that is an a really that would be a really powerful way if we can somehow frame it like that and I think hopefully something that will work on our side is it'll be like just in general, like exponential, right? If more people like kind of word of mouth get around more and more people will like kind of want to get trained, right? I think that would all kind of work together. But I think framing That's a great it like idea. that is helpful. Those are, yeah, those are called micro credentials and those can be, you can, you know, we do that sacred heart. Um, yeah. Kind of come up with the thing. So that's a great idea. We could probably look into how we could do that for free, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Other thoughts about barriers to training? Um, does CT train appear to be, and Barbara, you seem to use it the most, does it seem to be an efficient platform? I, and I, I've never had trouble with, with CT train. But I have heard in different training uh, curriculums, there have been some wrinkles. Has anybody reported that the platform itself, CT Train, is not workable? Well, it depends upon you know browsers and platforms and how people are bringing it into their computer. Some people are having trouble with that. Um, I just wanted to say too that you know we have. We're dealing with an audience to be trained that is forever changing. So just because we do a class, you know, for a group of people on point A, when you come six months later, you're going to have a different group of people because we're always rotating students, residents, providers, people change jobs from one place to another. Um, so we always have rotating audiences. And I think that's a reality we have to accept that this training will never stop. You know, you went to medical school, you went to nursing school, you went to social work school, you don't have to go back. But the audience will always be changing and new people will be joining the platform, if you will. Um, so to understand that it's going to be ongoing all the time, I think is significant. Um, can I just ask on CT train, doesn't the person who takes it move it along at whatever speed they're moving it along? Yes, that's correct. So if somebody could finish it in 15 minutes or 30 minutes or... So I don't think the fact I don't think it's an hour. Uh, I, I know my I training session is an under, hour. I took yeah, it mine's under an hour thirty minutes. Mine's an hour because I have it approved for CMEs. So that's why my training is an hour. Personal personal training. 
Okay. I feel like I'm a personal trainer. It is a good word. <laughs> <laughs> I will just caution as a person at Yale New Haven Hospital who has to take like 45 of these trainings every year that making it really easy to get through might not be what we want if the goal is really to get people to like absorb something from it. So like would an intentional 12 minute video or 15 minute video that gets the point across be better that you can't skip than something that's an supposed yeah. to be 45 minutes long, but you can click, 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 click. Yeah. Okay, I'm well certified. <laughs> you know, I don't think we need to dilute it. I, I, I agree yeah. with you, Nick. We ought not to be diluting it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, some of our health stream courses are mandatory, some are not. So I don't have great, in the Hartford Healthcare system, I get a list of who uses it. Um, and there's very few people on it. Very few people, because it's, it's not mandatory. So any other, actually, as I see this, should I make it bigger for all of you? Are there any other barriers towards the end? I have this revelation. So, um, are we missing anything? And then and many of these are incomplete thoughts. So, Please don't judge me on this. They look good, Barbara. They look good. Yeah. <laughs> great. Jim's hands up. Yep. Well, I just have a have a question that's somewhat related. I mean, part of part of this um, movement for most uh, linked up with and grew from this effort to um, initiate uh, discussions about the conversation. How do you talk to people? Uh, who, uh, for whom a most might be appropriate, but most is not the subject really. It's it's the conversations. How do how do people approach that? And I, my question is this: how, Are there other sources of training or support for practitioners who um, who are approaching this for the first time, or who who uh, want to share their experiences with others? Uh, that are totally independent of most. And I just want to know, is that going on in the background to some degree? Uh, and what? Very kind of, much so. Okay. And how, how does that, in, in what uh, form does that take? There are, there, there's something called Vital Talk okay. and the Conversation Project, and there's others as well. Yeah, I'm and aware of the Conversation Project. Thing. It, Jim, we talk about most in the Palliative Care Advisory okay. Council. Sure. Um, not not a lot, but we uh, but the group does want to know more about most. So I give them updates on the work that we've done thus far. So those conversations are happening with that council. Right. Well, I was just thinking that's that's a combination of an outreach opportunity, but it's also uh, it it informs us of alternative sources of information people have that maybe we don't have to be redundant with in our in our training so should we That's develop an one of inventory the things of what's being done uh, well i i was just curious because i i don't i don't know i'm not part i'm not part of that world so i just didn't know what else was going on so I, so, I so jim this is that's the kind of thing that those are the sorts of things that I, when I do my my teaching for my FMP students, I go through the process. They do some um, some homework about it. They go through the conversation project and fill out the, you know, my my I forget what it's called my 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 wishes or my needs or whatever it is. We right. we do the um we we do a couple of exercises to kind of get them thinking about it before they even attend. So there's a lot you know there are a lot of different ways to approach it. Um, that's a little bit different, though, because I have the time and I kind of have the captive audience. If we're one, if we want to do something that's a bit more, um, you know, that that's going to be disseminated broadly, uh, you know, I guess I'm thinking that's our priority of getting that really meaty information out there in an accessible way. And then if, you know, the case study, I think would be helpful. Maybe folks think that that's, you know, above and beyond. But I think that is it. I found that to be extremely helpful. But there probably are a few different ways we can 
we can get this information across, but starting with a very meaty provider based, um, you know, offering similar to what we did, but much shorter and a little bit more to the point. Well, it's just, I, I mean, it, as, if, if there are other resources that people can turn to, which is, yeah. which is what I was trying to get at, uh, I think it's good to point, point them out to people. And yes. because so, so much of this is about, you know, what you bring yourself, what, what attitudes or, or background you have approaching this conversation, as well as mm -hmm. the, cir the circumstances that uh, are confronting the patient you're, you're talking with. So that's- I um, like that very much, Jim. I uh, like the idea of giving them the resources to, to um, pursue their skills speaking. Yeah, because I mean, I, I, that is a big important part of this, but it's not necessarily part of exactly what we would call most training. So, um, Barbara Jacobs. I was just going to say, I think Jim's initial point is, uh, is, is focusing on you know, that this is part of the conversation, right? And the conversation is really the important sort of nexus of this issue. But there's undergraduate education and then there's obviously postgraduate education and certifications and those kinds of things. But I do believe there's really hundreds of programs for people to, to learn about something like most. It won't be exactly most because we're very state specific as most most programs are. But I do think there's a number of those programs, but they're geared towards palliative care and hospice care. And there are NYU, for example, does, has a postgraduate certificate in this. Um, but what we're dealing with is the postgraduate continuing education audience it seems mm -hmm. to be the ones that we're trying to focus on. And I, and I think it's really important to have the idea that the conversation is the focus. Most is just a method to uh, once you have that conversation to where you're going to take it next. Mm -hmm. But it is a, an important point, and I think we can do that inventory of availability of uh, other palliative care and hospice care uh, educational opportunities. But I again think we need to focus on who are we trying to get to. And I can, the palliative care folks know about this, the hospice folks know about it. Acute care is not quite the right place. I'm looking more towards how can we get into the other environments that we need to identify. So we have providers and then we have environments where mm -hmm. the people who benefit from it most will be. And I think those are the points that we need to really capture. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca, thanks. Um, I was just going to say that actually there's a lot of hospice people and a lot of palliative care people who are unaware of most. And also that um, that most is the fruit of those conversations and also that any patient who qualifies for a most should be considered a palliative care patient. Every single last one of them. They, they not hospice but they certainly would qualify for palliative care. Sure. So we are at the top of the hour. Yes. Um, I will follow up. So next steps, I will follow up with CHA to see if they can accommodate us with a room. Uh, sometime early December, I won't go past the 15th of December because I think we get into busy holiday season time. Um, and if if we're, here's where, if we're not ready uh, in January, that's okay. Um, but we're going to be able to demonstrate good faith efforts to get this done. So any other action steps that we have? And we have our meeting next Tuesday, our regular monthly meeting. So hopefully I will see you all there. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Valia, thank you. Thanks for bringing us together. Thank Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.